Troll Lord Games. Join the fray. And here we are for GM Strict at a trade number 80. The Art of War 3. This is the third part in a three-part series discussing mass combat. Or combats that are sort of like that. We are going to discuss morale today. I assume, Tim, that I've got sound and video. I can see the video, so I assume that there's sound involved with this mess as well. Yes, we did, Grape Ape. It is fantastic. I think we hit it uh, sometime Tuesday night, which was really cool. Uh, it's, it's a nice, you know, marker to strike, I suppose. All right, what's going on over here? Too many variables. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Good deal, Digor Jones. Digor don't. I don't know. <laughs> I can't do any internet names. <laughs> this is also, of course, a day that uh, we remember Mr. Gary Gygax, a good friend of mine uh, and uh, compadre in publishing, uh, who passed away today 13 years ago. It's crazy to think about it. Absolutely crazy to think about it. I got the news right over in that corner of the office. <clears throat> very strange. It was a very strange day that was. But it is slow as I still cannot choose a little rest. So annoying. <sighs> it just called me butt monkey. There you go. <laughs> that's a little easier to. That's a little easier to say. <laughs> Many of the uh, internet names are challenging to say the least. To say the least. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was very interesting uh, working with Gary. Uh, we worked with Gary for about eight years, I think, and uh, we became good friends. And it was just—it was just a wild time. I mean, it was—it was much as you would expect it to be. He was the consummate game master and game creator to the very end, which is cool. Very cool. I'll have to. Open a Dr. Pepper here in a minute. Quick AMA question. Can the Primal Druid choose from the regular Druid spells also? Yes. Yes. They should have access to all of that mess. Um, they got pretty limited spells, right, though, don't they? I think they do. If I recall, they do. Yeah, I put up a Facebook, a Facebook post about Gary. Uh, I don't know a lot of people, you know, want to remember Gary for this, for that, for this, and that's all great, but... Uh, I wanted, I wanted to remind people, and I'll take a moment here to remind people, that Gary actually had only just gotten started. He was, uh, I, and this is what I posted on Facebook, he, um, so I went up in January of 2008. He passed away in March of 2008, and I went up in January of 2008 for a convention that Troll Lord Games did in Lake Geneva. We did two a year in Lake Geneva, Winter Dark and Lake Geneva Gaming Convention. Uh, and it gave us a place, gave Gary a place, because he couldn't travel as easily as he used to, so it gave Gary a place to game and uh, meet people and people to come up and, and blah, blah, blah. But I remember, uh, I remember that uh, it was that Saturday after the you know, cons opened, everybody sitting around doing their games. Gary had done, I think, one of his tours that he did and stuff like that. And he came in with his list of stuff, and we sat down, and uh, we, we went over all the projects that we were working on at the time, which included Castle Zagig. Uh, Kings of England, Kings of France, Legendary Adventures, the role-playing game had completely been overhauled, new art, uh, new layout, the whole nine yards. We were on, we had the player's book done, we were in the, uh, the Game Master's book, and the Monster book was partially done. So, um, there was all of that, and there was gore, I mean, there was all, anyways. So we went over the stuff that we were working on, and then when, <laughs> when that was done, he pulled out a list um, or either that, I don't, I don't honestly remember him pulling a list out, but I think that he did. One of us made a list, uh, and I probably got it around here somewhere, uh, of stuff that he wanted to do. These are the next projects we we're going to work on. Once we've got these done, we're going to work on these. And it was this laundry list of things, just a huge number of expansions for the Legendary Adventure stuff. There were so many expansions for the LA game many of which were already in the works. And then the GFW series is going to be overhauled in more books, uh, easily another three or four books added to it. We'd already started on a couple of them. 
Uh, there was the Gord the Rogue's going to be completely redone. There were so many, there were so many projects that Gary wanted to work on at the end that I, I remember just being stunned. I mean, he's seventy something years old, and and uh, it's just it's it was literally like he's just getting started now. Uh, okay, we we made it here. Now it's time to get started, uh, which was cool. And I remember thinking to myself, "Oh my sweet God." There's so there's so much stuff that he wants to work on. It's going to squash TLG's other publishing schedule, which would have been fine. Uh, and I remember getting in the truck with Mark. Mark Sandy was, uh, in those days, he went to all the cons with me. And, um, and Davis may have been there. I can't remember. But I remember getting in the truck and saying um, something to the effect is, uh, oh, my God, he's only he's just gotten started. <laughs> We've got years of work ahead of us. To which Mark laughed, of course, and moved on. But... Uh, uh, it, it was it was it was really cool, and it was nice to see. You know, he passed away a couple of couple of months after that. That would have been like January fifteenth or something, and he passed away on March eighth. Um, so eight weeks later, of course, uh, it came to an end. But um, it is it, it it was amazing to me, and in this in this day and age of you know whatever whatever, it, it's nice to know. It's it's nice for people to see that he was still creating. He was still a a machine of creativity that was still just rolling out literally, you know, TLG's, uh, TLG's byline, whatever, slogan, for years and years and years, was worlds of epic adventure, and literally inside Gary's head were worlds of epic adventure that we had only just, just begun to scratch the surface. Um, but uh, it is what it is, of course, uh, that's also a TLG <laughs> slogan, <laughs> when Gary wholeheartedly <laughs> endorsed. But um, uh, it, it was it was a pleasure working with Gary, without a doubt. And people should really know that he had he had only just gotten started. Um, all right. All kinds of stuff going on, but that is today. Today is uh, we we mark the uh, the passing of Mr. Gary Gygax, a good friend of mine, a fantastic game designer, and just an all around good person. He was just an all around good person. Um, thank you, Obsidian. Uh, how's it going? Last laugh retro. It, you know, Obsidian. It's funny. I um, we we so often stop and commiserate and commemorate and. And all of this stuff. That wasn't who Gary was. Gary didn't look back. I mean, I worked with him for eight years, and I don't think, I don't think, I don't have memory of him talking about all of the troubles with TSR at all. He wasn't interested in that stuff. That was a long time ago, uh, or it was yesterday, and he didn't care. He was, <laughs> he was with me. Now it may have been different with other people, but with me, it was always forward, forward, forward. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that Gary and I work so well together. I don't really... What happened yesterday is gone. I can't do anything about it. Sorry. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, I, but I can fix today or maybe tomorrow. Uh, it, but tomorrow, yesterday, meh, it's gone. Uh, and, and we both kind of looked at things that way. So I just, I, I felt today, that we know we really needed to, to say stuff about where we were going, what Gary was doing. He's just good people. He was just good people. Gary brought me to TLG, and I'll always be grateful for that, and a bunch of other stuff as well. Oh, well, that's very cool. That's very cool. He, you know, um, he's a hell. He's a huge reason why Castles and Crusades came about. There was essentially three three driving forces that that created the game. One was Davis and Mac had really they didn't want to continue to to do things for D twenty. They wanted to make their own system, and they had been toying with stuff for years. And, of course, we focused on Gary's material and D20 material in those days. And, uh, two, uh, I, I didn't particularly care for D20 that much. It was too complicated for me, so I needed a game that I could sell. So it had to be something that I wanted, that I was really passionate about. Uh, and, and, three, Gary was looking for a home for Castle Zagig, and he needed a system that could be compatible with AD&D as he saw it. Uh, which, and that's one reason when we created Castles and Crusades, Gary... We sent the rules to Gary. Now, Gary didn't have control of Troll Lord Games, and he didn't tell us what to do. But if Gary said, I don't like this, ah, change this, we'd change it. I mean, we would shift out of it. Uh, but by and large, I think he only had, and I can't remember what 
it was. He had problems with one one thing we created, and I cannot remember what it was, and that was actually a misinterpretation that he got off of the internet. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 Gary was a huge part of TLG's publication, a huge part of what we've done here, uh, and the foundations of this company rest on his shoulders. So, and and I will always be grateful for that, uh, and never forget that. And anyone who uh, you know, carries this <laughs> this TLG legacy on in the future should be well aware. Um, it probably, there's only been twice since I started this company. Uh, in the beginning, Mac Golden was CEO and he ran the company. And that lasted for about a year and a half, maybe two years. Uh, and then when he left, I became CEO of the company. And I've been that way since 02 or 01 or 03 or whatever the hell it was. But there's only been a couple of times, too, that I could think of that I was about ready to just call it a day. And one was March 4th, 2008. I, when, when Gary passed, I couldn't quite figure out what I was supposed to be doing now. With, if I'm not working with Gary, why am I doing this? Uh, it, it passed as he would have... <laughs> He would have boxed my ears and I shut the company down because he passed away. That would have not amused Gary at all. But, um, uh, yeah, he was he was something else. And he is definitely part of the foundation of this company, uh, of that it is an, the inescapable truth and of which I am extraordinarily grateful uh, and always will be. Uh, but... I think I am going to have a Dr. Pepper. I'll raise it. I'll raise it to to Gary, though. I don't think he drank Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw him drink a soda. To be honest with you, surely he did. <laughs> but uh... yeah, no spotted cow, blue flowers, whiskey, a lot of whiskeys. But I, I don't remember ever seeing him drink a coke. Surely he did. Craziness, craziness, craziness. All right, well, here we go. All right. And this is to Gary. I have no whiskey in my office. We only do we only do uh, morning drinking around here to gear us up for for whatever insanity is coming for us from Troll Lord Games, and it is a never-ending wedge of insanity. Though I will say today is relatively calm, which is nice. Uh, but we are here for GM's Tricks of the Trade number eighty, uh, and this is Art of War Part Three. Uh, as always, thank you for showing up. Please join the conversation over here. Throw out any questions or comments you have. Many of you people are experienced game masters yourselves. You've run into these situations that I'm going to talk about, and we'd love to hear from you. I mean, you have you, <laughs> your thoughts are probably more valid than mine because many of you have gamed a lot different systems. I've just been a game master. You know, I don't really run a lot of systems. But uh, so throw your comments out. We'd love to hear from you. And if you haven't, please give us a follow. Uh, we are working hard to build uh, the whole uh, Twitch uh, streaming part of everything. I don't know the terminology, whatever it is, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, we broke a thousand followers on Tuesday, and it would be great to see it just continue to go. So let your friends know, let everybody know uh, that we'll be bopping around over here on Twitch. I forgot to actually post about today's today's stream on my own Facebook page. There you go. But at any rate, we are talking about morale today. Uh, GM Tricks of the Trade number 80. Uh, the first two segments of this you can see over on YouTube or on our database if you go through the Patreon stuff and all of that. Um, so the first trick of the trade, uh, and what we're talking about is anything from large individual combats where it's the party against say 100 orcs or 50 orcs or whatever or armies that are clashing and the party is caught up in these armies in one capacity or the other uh that is kind of where we're we're landing today and morale is one of the uh morale is a huge part of any army of course it's a huge part of battle uh any of you who have read military history and i know a lot of you have know that armies can break very suddenly um and it's it's hard to kind of in the, in the moment now after the after action reports come in the people can you know officers and uh, historians and whatnot can kind of pinpoint where and maybe what caused an army to break but frequently it just breaks and the morale is gone and the army begins to disintegrate far more rapidly than you can imagine uh, or that you would want to imagine really and it, it, it really disintegrates as rapidly as a man or a woman who can run and they can run pretty fast, <laughs> especially if someone's trying to kill them. Um, so morale is a part 
of battle. It's a part of uh, the table. And there's certainly most game systems. I know that Castles and Crusades has, has them. Most game systems have morale rules. Uh, but frequently, the morale using rules as, as drawn up and written up in a book is not... It's not conducive to rapid play, number one, and it's not... If you have to stop and go read and, and do a bunch of checks and figure out a bunch of casualty percentages and rates and whatnot, then it, it might it, it might slow your combat down a little bit. So what we're talking about today is ways to just kind of speed right through that. And just, there's rules, great, love them, move on, <laughs> do it yourself. Uh, and that's where we're, we're going to jump in with trick of the trade number one. Once an army broke, that's when the real killing begins. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, once they start running, it's and a lot of those in the medieval period, a lot of those cavalry units were used to, to just mop up the battlefield, uh, and it, the casualty rates could be extraordinarily high at that point. But armies did break, and they broke, then they broke suddenly. Yeah, I think it's the Battle of Bovines that the English broke uh, was Philip Augustus is one of his greatest victories, and it was the English army was annihilated. Uh, I mean, it happened frequently. Once one army kind of began to disintegrate, the casualty rating went from kind of equal to completely unequal um, as they just left. So the first thing is to, as you, as you dive into the, the combat, and again, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. As you dive into the combat, get an idea of what you're using as a, as a GM, what monsters, what's their morale like? When do they break? What's their breaking point? What are they afraid of? What is going to terrorize them? Is a is a flame strike suddenly coming out of a, a, a cloudless sky going to terrify these people, or is it going to embolden them? Uh, is uh, having a lot of loss of their leaders, is that going to do it? Is just a, a sheer number game, is that going to do it? Whatever it is, just kind of have an idea of what, um, of what you want, where you want this army to break, what their breaking point is. Uh, and it doesn't have to be... It doesn't have to be consistent throughout, like orcs only break when their leaders dies. Well, maybe some do and maybe some don't. Uh, you can change that, you know, you probably want some vain, uh, vague consistency to it, but you don't really need a lot. Um, just get an idea of what's going to happen. What is, what is it going to take, is the best way to put it. What is it going to take to break this army? And when they get to that point, <clears throat> when they get to that point, let it happen. It suddenly, it quite suddenly breaks. You, you don't have to make a check for it. You're looking at the field. You're looking at... We talked about using miniatures and having lots of miniatures on the field. There's a lot of them dead on the ground. There's 30 or 40 already dead hobgoblins. What do those last 20 hobgoblins do? Um, oh, this is Luke Gygax. i got to take this real quick. Hey, Luke. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Hey, I'm streaming right now, so you're technically streaming too. Yeah. Well, I saw I missed your call yesterday. Let me let me call you back right after the stream, right? <laughs> Luke says hello, everybody. All right, dude, I'm calling you a little bit. I had to take that one, guys. Now I'm going to turn the I'm going to turn the sound off. Um, I, as those of you who may or may not know, I don't know what's going on with this damn phone. And we just released uh, Ernie and Luke Gygax's um, Lost City of Gaxmore. It turned out to be fantastic. It just it looks great. It plays great. It's just a great thing, and it's selling like hotcakes. Uh, so he and I are concocting schemes about what comes next. So, <laughs> so it's a great thing. And, of course, Gary Kahn is three weeks down the line or something like that. Put Luke on speaker so we can hear the exciting news. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, what, were, what were we talking about? Uh, see, he boosted our morale. That's what, <laughs> that's what Luke did. He boosted our morale. Uh, let's <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. More morale is circumstantial, not random. Yeah, you know, it, there's usually a, a point, something that breaks, something that drives them uh, over the edge. And but you you kind of need to decide that you don't really, but you you can decide it in the moment. But kind of have an idea of what's happening as you go into the battle. So when you get to that point, you can actually weave it into the into the uh, the combat itself, or weave it into the story that you're trying to, to do. I will frequently have uh, I'll, I'll have an idea of when these guys are going to break, and, and I'll wait. I think this gets into trick of the trade three. Uh, yeah, this actually gets in number three, but but I'll kind of plan on when it when it's actually going to break, when they're actually going to kind of scatter and go in every which direction, 
and I'll tie that in. I'll tie that into into the battle itself, so that, and we'll get to this in a minute, so that I can use the morale breaking as part of an emotional give and take with the characters. But at any rate, so as you're going into, we we'll get to that number three. As you're going into it, just have an idea. Uh, of when this army is going to crack, when when is what is their breaking point, point? and it is, you don't have to. It doesn't have to be written in stone. It, it just kind of an idea, just a general idea. Of this is what's going to happen. These guys are going to run, um, and and if you want to make a check, you can do it on your own. You don't have to roll any dice. It can just be okay. This army begins to disintegrate. Uh, the guys on the flank starts running away. That type of thing, or you can make checks if if that's what you want to do. Make some checks. Just get an idea. Uh, thank you for the uh, subscription, Omzet. Very, very much appreciated. Uh, scheme away. Yeah, we got, there's all kinds of stuff, but Luke, <laughs> Luke is very much like his dad. He's got, and Ernie too. I talked to Ernie last week. Uh, lots and lots of ideas, but he's still got a very, very full-time job. <laughs> and California has been just, and the coronavirus has savaged it. The fires have savaged it. I mean, it's just, California's had a very, very rough couple of, uh, six months or so. And he's in... He's in the Army National Guard out in California, so he has had a very rough, <laughs> very rough six months or so. Um, yeah, a lot of the states in the in the Union are getting beaten up, but not old Arkansas. Uh, my dad used to say, Arkansas doesn't know bad times because it's always bad times here. <laughs> so, <laughs> when things go when things go awry, we're like, ah, it's Tuesday. All right, so that aside, uh, what, do, what do we got here? Yeah, trick of the trade number two. And again, if you have any comments or questions, throw them into the stream. I'd love to hear about it. And please give us a follow if you have not already. Uh, encourage them to role play through the battle. I gotta remember these. I don't, Chuck normally makes notes for me. I don't, I don't have the notes up here on the thing. So what is number two? Oh yeah, so this is one of my favorite things. Uh, California is so big. We're fine down here. Thanks, Luke, for your service. Uh, it is a huge state. <laughs> it's monstrous. I've driven the length of California. I drove down from, uh, what's, Washington? Yes. Oregon? Oregon. Oregon. I came down from Oregon. Actually, I came from Seattle through Oregon all the way down California to Barstow. Is that right? Does that sound right? And then from Barstow all the way across the country to Arkansas. It was a long drive. I really liked Barstow. I don't know why. Can't remember why. Hmm. Uh, do you remember the old joke? Why hasn't Louisiana fallen to the Gulf? <laughs> yeah. I don't. What's the punchline, Geek Preacher? You know that's our neighbors down south, so <laughs> they're not. They're not much better off than we are. <laughs> so <laughs> I love Louisiana. It is an insanely beautiful state. If you have never gone, because Arkansas sucks. <laughs> There you go. If you've never been to Louisiana, you know, you always hear about New Orleans. I ah, forget New Orleans. Everybody goes to New Orleans. Go to northern Louisiana. It is some of the prettiest country you'll ever see. And if you're running games, if you're a GM, you're going to pass through some of the just oldest, most beautiful swamp land. It's kind of been reclaimed, but you've got these giant trees with the, what is that? Uh, I can't remember the moss that hangs off of them. It's just crazy beautiful down there. If you ever get a chance, just skirt through northern Louisiana. I will warn you. I will. I'm from northeast. I forgot you were from Louisiana. I will warn you. And Geek Preacher, I'm sure you'll back me up. Do not speed in Louisiana if you are not from Louisiana. <laughs> they will give you a ticket in a nanosecond. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, just watch your speed if you're driving through there. Middle of nowhere, Barstow. Yeah, I don't know why I like that town. It just left a good... A good feeling in my mouth. I can't remember why. That was 20 years ago. I passed through Barstow. <laughs> who, the, who the hell knows? Mother Nature took a chunk out of the Pacific Coast Highway into the ocean. It's, it's been a rough time out there. <laughs> yes, do not speed. Do not speed in Louisiana. <clears throat> Arkansas, you can kind of get away with it. People here are pretty friendly. All right, so uh, trick of the trade number two. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and this is actually allowing Spanish moss. That's what it's called. Yes, that's what, <laughs> that's why Tim put that there. I thought I had that original thought, Tim. It wasn't. It was because you put Sp <laughs> Spanish in the, in the, uh, whatever, the stream. There you go. <laughs> 
You ain't from around here, are you, boy? <laughs> Barstow was mentioned in the Route 66. Is Barstow, so... I don't think it's... What is the song from Dark Star, the movie Dark Star that came out in the 60s? The guy who created Aliens created Dark Star, Alien, created Dark Star... Something... Benson. It's Benson, Arizona. It's Benson, Arizona. It's not Barstow, California at all. It's Benson, Arizona. Anyways. I spent so much time in Louisiana and they don't want me back anyways. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting state. I like it down there, but um, it's hot. Damn it, it was my life growing up. Move 30 miles and they'll tell you that. Yeah. Barstow leads to Fort Irwin. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, I, I have been almost... I've never been to Alaska, but I've been to almost every state in the Union. I think I've been to every state in the Union. Surely I have. Idaho, maybe not. I don't know. But um, love it all. Love it all. All right, so let's get back to Tricks of the Trade. Uh, number two. So this is something I absolutely love to do. Uh, it's to bring and to allow the characters to actually have an impact upon the battlefield, uh, morale-wise. So a lot of class abilities are going to have intimidate. They're going to have all kinds of of things that they can do, actually checks that they can make to scare the enemy or to keep them from doing this, that, or the other. And that's all great, and that's all fine. And your mechanics are covering that, and you, as a GM, are going to make whatever adjustments that you need to make for that to actually happen. That's cool. Uh, but uh, it's perfectly cool, and it's actually, you should encourage players to actually, for their, whatever they're doing, uh, whatever they're doing on the field to, to impact the enemy. Uh, so if they uh, are role-playing battle cries and shouts and they're, they're trying to do something, they're describing something that they're doing, uh, you know, to scatter the enemy or whatever, let it come into play. Whether you roll or not, that doesn't matter. It's probably a good idea to roll just so that there's a chance involved and they can see that. Although maybe you've already predetermined that it's going to succeed despite that. But what you do, uh, if characters are role-playing through something and, you know, and they're doing some great speech or whatever it is, and the enemy wavers in front of them. They break before them just a little bit. Maybe they don't completely run. Maybe they lose their action for the round, or they lose initiative the next round, or whatever it is. It's just that moment that you've seen in a thousand TV shows where one of the main characters, you know, stems forward and puts himself at risk to scare everybody, or whatever it is. Allow your players to do that, and allow that to actually have a concrete uh, a reaction on the battlefield where um, something happens from it. That'll encourage them to keep doing it. It'll encourage other players to do it. And that'll make the whole thing far more energetic and the whole thing just moving forward. I mean, you'll get in time. It takes time to build players to the point that they like to do this stuff or really get into this type of thing. But uh, you, you can really kind of turn... Uh, you, you can mold, I guess, and maybe that's the right word. I don't really like that word. That sounds too close to manipulating. And you're not really manipulating. You're kind of manipulating. But it, you're, what, you're, what you're doing is encouraging. We're going to go with encouraging. <laughs> Words are important, they say. Uh, you're encouraging people to take that extra step in role play, which just makes everything more enjoyable at the table. Uh, it just brings out more emotion, brings out everything, which is, at the end of the day, what you, what you kind of want to do. I spent a month at Fort Irwin playing more. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Idaho, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Someday I'll go there. Uh, I almost went to school on Idaho. Uh, I got to spend that, what felt like a year at Fort Polk one month doing the same thing. Doing the same thing, yes. Jared, he's, yeah, that, I can't imagine how unbelievably hot Fort Polk would be. I did Fort Benning. I did jump school at Fort Benning. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever been that hot. It was so hot. I remember we'd fall into formation, you know, before we did whatever. Um, I get 4.30 in the morning, and there would be guys just standing there sweating, just sweating from the heat because it's just, it's just miserable hot down in southern Alabama, southern Mississippi, and Louisiana. It's just, it's just hot and humid. Eat to surf, yes, absolutely. It's the battle cry. Really, are the things that I uh, that I encourage. That, and the thing is, if they do a battle cry and it has no impact on the table, on the the foes that they're fighting, there's a good chance they're not going to do it again. But if they do and it does, uh, there's a good chance they're going to do it again. And then you'll get into this thing. This is what, and we talked about this two weeks ago, or maybe a little bit ago. I don't know what I'm talking about. People talking at the table during a battle. Uh, I have to tell my players all the time that. 
talking between characters is not an action. You can sword fight and shout something across, you know, the yard. Uh, so if you can actually encourage them to do battle cries and to shout, you know, you know, back and forth to one another or whatever it is, then uh, all of that kind of plays into it. The battle cry will kind of encourage them to talk to each other, which will encourage them to do battle cries, and then you get this f- much more dynamic uh, scenario because now you've got not only are you guys rolling dice and you're moving managers if that's what you want to do, or you're you're doing descriptions or however it is that you're doing it. But now you've got three, four, five, six other people doing the same thing. And there's chaos. And that's what a battle... That's part of what I always try to do when I'm doing battles. Engender a little bit of chaos. Because I, I want there to be... I want it to be chaotic. I want people to have to think quickly. I want them to not know what's coming. Or what they try to do goes awry. Or it only partially works. Uh, and there's just some confusion. If, if Now, if they're completely confused, that's not good. But it's okay for someone to just say, I'm not sure what's going on. That's okay, because you can really only see you know, right, what's in front of you. That's what you're focused on. Because if you pay attention to what spell the wizard is casting for the next round, you're going to get stabbed. So it's best that there's just this chaos, and that chaos kind of fuels the emotive responses that you want to engender from combat situations so that when they walk away from the table... They, 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 their adrenaline begins to settle down and they, there's a visible sigh of relief. That's what you want uh, so that the, the combat round is different than just the role-playing and the adventuring round. Poking around in a chest or listening at a door should be very different than a combat. I yell at the creatures I'm fighting all the time. GM has them yell back. It enlivens the combat. It really does. I mean, that's a perfect way of putting it. It, it just it makes it all feel like you're in a TV show. You know, you're watching an episode of Vikings where they're fighting, and that's what we've got here. This is the Siege of York, I think, is where I got that picture, maybe. I don't know. But there's so much chaos going on in these things, and everybody's shouting, and there's so much noise. Uh, and if you can get your players to do that, it just helps fuel the whole the whole mess. How do you create, create chaos at the table? Mechanics or descriptions? Descriptions, always. I, I will always toss mechanics aside in a heartbeat and do descriptions. Uh, mechanics, the problem with mechanics, uh, and this is one reason I like Castles and Crusades because it's so mechanic light, um, that the problem with them is you'll start kind of trying to figure out a distance. You're trying to figure out, you know, if you can take two actions, you can, you're trying to figure out so many things, and then you're debating it, and then you got to check the player's handbook or the CKG or whatever it is, and then your whatever emotion you have, whatever, whatever energy you had, that's that's done. Now now we're having a discussion, which has value at certain points, but to me it doesn't. So I I always will lean. I'll I'll do a mechanic, but I'll steamroller through a mechanic in a heartbeat uh, to do a, to 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 bring descriptions in, and I try to encourage the players to describe what they're doing as well. You know, I move to the left and swing. I'm going to try to hit him in the leg. You know, whatever it is, just to give even more I don't know more texture to the combat that you're in. I like mechanics. They're okay. I'm just lying at that point. I don't really like mechanics. <laughs> if, I could do, if I could do the whole thing, you know, without mechanics, I would. But uh, you can't. You just absolutely cannot do it without mechanics. There has to be some kind of baseline. You know, or it's just it's just whatever. Playtime. Uh, do you use morale rolls like 1E? Is that something CNC does? Started to try morale things for 5E with my PCs. Uh, Steam Strategy, I do, I, I, it, it's all in my head at this point. Uh, Fields of Battle for Castles and Crusades covers the morale. It's got a great system. Casey Christofferson wrote it. Uh, he's a great writer, great game designer. Um, I think there's also a second set in the CKG. I can't remember now, but I generally speaking, when I go into the combat, how's it going, Green Linton? Uh, when I go into the combat, I have an idea of what what their breaking point is, the army's breaking point or the creature's breaking point, and when it gets close to that. Uh, and I'll even do it individually. So you'll have like like this battle I did not long ago. I had a whole bunch of hobgoblins attacking. Well, there's two types of hobgoblins. There's kind of infantry hobgoblins and then these slingers and javelin guys. But the slingers and javelin guys were getting shot to pieces with the, with the bowmen, and uh, their morale broke before the, the infantry did. And when the when they began to run... Uh, they didn't run, they kind of fell back out of range, the infantry didn't care, they kept going so I was really doing two kind of morales simultaneously when I did that uh, so I, I, I 
try not for my game I, I don't rely heavily on the rules I rely on what what and when I want the, the army to break <clears throat> if they get to that point sometimes they don't get to that point sometimes the characters just get slaughtered <clears throat> uh, well that kind of answers the question I asked only when lines separated or during a lull do you have a moment to look about uh, yeah that's that is very very true and we were at Warren many would flee when they received a serious injury when one of their allies fell kept the characters from getting in over their heads and kept the rare rats from getting slaughtered. The PCs were quite frustrated to not get a stand-up fight. Now, that's a great... Running battles like that are fantastic. Uh, to me, they're, they're one of the most enjoyable things because there's no... Uh, there's no clear victor. You know, every time you, you watch a TV show, this guy wins. Well, I like it sometimes. Well, nobody wins. It's just a... It's just a grueling, you know, <laughs> sack fight. and It's over now and we're all just standing there exhausted. I love that type of battle. How do you handle players who in, go into elaborate descriptions that take up extensive time to the judgment of gameplay for others at the table? Yeah, so I've got I got one of those uh, at the table. For, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's one of those things because you don't want to squash anybody's enthusiasm, and uh, especially frequently that person is going to be doing most of the descriptions that's not from behind the screen. So. You don't want to squash that either because they're so into the game and they're helping fuel the whole thing, right, with their own descriptions, which is great. However, like you said, it can easily just suck the oxygen out of the room. Um, it's hard to know because I don't like to interrupt people when they're doing character stuff. Uh, I really don't like to do that because you get into this kind of habit. So um, the first thing, I, I, know, I, I know the player very, very well, so I can say, all right, we got it. <laughs> we got it. We, we got to move on. Um, and if that doesn't work, if because you want to run at convention games and stuff like that, uh, I think probably the best way to do it is tie someone else's description into it. So while while they're describing what what they're doing, say, and maybe not what they look like, but what they're doing. So he's doing. Uh, he's casting a spell. That's, he's going to try to do the darkness or whatever. Tie it. Say, okay, while you're doing that. And so you kind of have to interrupt because you're bringing it on the player. While you're doing that, uh, that actually impacts what the halfling is doing because they were sneaking around. They might get caught up in the darkness. Uh, so halfling, you see that the wizard's beginning. So what you've basically done is you're shifting, you're shifting the conversation from the wizard, who's being overly descriptive, to the to the person playing the halfling. Now, yep, you've got it and this spell, but it's going to impact the halfling. So halfling, while he's doing this, what are you going to do? Blah, blah, blah. And it just kind of shifts the focus away. Uh, without being rude and interrupting and squashing someone's desire to really, to really do it. Now, if you've got an old old crew that's played together for a long time, it's probably a lot easier to kind of just say, "Got it, <laughs> you know, move on next." Uh, but try to sidestep it. And what do we call that? With is it misdirecting? Is that that's not really misdirection, I suppose. Uh, just shift the focus to someone else because then, and it, especially if it's someone else who's not. Well, you, you really want someone that is actually into a little bit of the descriptive text, but not overly much so. So that they'll bring their own stuff in and kind of put a, a kibosh on what that player's doing. One question about facilitating these moments in a battle. As a GM, do you leave the, the ball on the player's court to come up with ideas of how to take these actions in battle? Like, other than fighting, what do you do? Or do you frame it uh, up by saying things you can tell your nearby allies are afraid as you are side, as your side loses numbers? What do you do? Yeah, I try... And, of course, this is a huge... I'm, I'm going to shift the GM tricks of the trade soon to a player's tricks of the trade at, and how they can help the GM. Because this is a huge issue with um, the way just playing styles. I infinitely prefer a very reactive party that is constantly telling me what they're doing uh, and reacting to the descriptions that I give as opposed to me trying to draw out uh, what they do. So I actually try not to lay down too many options in front of them if any options in front of them i might describe that the left flank seems to be to, to be breaking and it looks like they're about to scatter uh, but the right flank in the center is still holding these hobs are running up the center you know whatever uh kind of encouraging them to do something because if you if you coach them too much if you give them like three options you know you can push these guys on the flank or beginning to break you can push them or you can hold them if you give them too many options then it's you're suddenly into this mechanical thing of what's going to have the best chance of succeeding when that's what you want to avoid um, you, you want to avoid anyone stopping and trying to 
break down the math. <laughs> you know, the, the counting the cards. Is that what that's called in Vegas? When you don't want anyone to count the cards. Uh, and that's sort of what that's that's sort of what you do when you lay options out in front of them. I love the idea for players' tricks of the trade, and yeah, I like to GM that way too, as not to appear too leading. Yeah, I try not. Sometimes you have to, of course. Sometimes you gotta get in there. <laughs> you gotta do this. One or the other. But mostly I try to, because I really, as a, and I've, I've talked about this before, as a GM, I'm trying to have fun too, and it's more fun for me if stuff's thrown at me that I don't know what's coming. Uh, that way I've got to react. I'm the one now having to do some kind of crazy reaction uh, without bending the rules or bending whatever, you know, the suspension of disbelief and to get out of the situation that they came up with. Uh, I, I absolutely love that stuff. I've got some very creative players at the table, so uh, it, it helps. So trigger the trade number three. So this kind of, we, we touched on this earlier. Uh, when the army's beginning to break, what you've already kind of established what that breaking point is. Uh, when do you let that come in? I frequently, I frequently will hold that until I know that um, the players are aggravated, they're emotional, they're beginning to fear loss. It looks like it's turning against them. Uh, and they start to really desperately look at their dice rolls and they start going through character sheets trying to find extra hit points or you know, extra abilities or whatever that they can do um, to keep themselves alive for two more melee rounds. If you've got them to that point, if you've got them really kind of nervous, but they've done a huge amount of structural damage to your encounter, the army suddenly breaks. Suddenly it's scattering in every which direction. It's much like we talked about at the beginning of the stream. It's not a gradual or gentle affair. It is... It breaks. One of the Hobbs is out. He says, I'm out. And as he runs, turns and runs, they uh, the ones next to him start to run. The ones next to them start to run. The others on the flanks see that. They start to run. And within two melee rounds, the whole thing is disintegrated. And the army is, is fleeing. What that does, essentially, is you've, you've... It's just like any horror movie or whatever. You've peaked them all the way up. Uh, and yet they... In fear. And yet they succeed anyways. Breakthrough, breakout. Uh, and then they, they tumble off down the the road to victory and that's it's just again that, that emotional chaos you want that kind of vested interest in what's going on uh, so that um, they're just they're hyped up about it and they remember it and they'll they'll be a part of it you know it'll be a part of the whole thing uh, that's the whole idea behind the morale break well not the whole idea that's a ridiculous thing to say that's a part of the part of the idea behind the morale break how's it going clever Yep, ex excellent idea for players' tricks. I need my players to help me guide my story. Yeah, you know, I've uh, over the years, I've literally since we've been doing this GM's tricks of the trade, I've come to realize that there's actually players can be, and you guys know this, players can be very destructive to a GM's <laughs> to a GM's game, to the mood, to the tone, to the plots, to the themes, to all, all of it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. There's some simple things that players can do. Um, to actually smooth <laughs> move things along in a more smooth manner. Yes, clever. That's who that is. I was thinking at first that that was uh, the, the son, Boneless. I remember the Boneless, but that's the Bishop. Uh, Vikings is a great show. I cannot sing its praises enough. If you have not watched Vikings, go watch Vikings. It's, I don't know where it is. It's Netflix, Hulu. I don't know where it is. I see. Okay, so this and this and this, that's a great segue, clever. That's brilliantly done. Uh, gives this scene here from Vikings. Uh, the bishop uh, is his army is disintegrated, but he has not. And this is trick of the trade. Even as that army disintegrates and they begin to run in every the trick of trade number four, as they begin to run in every which direction, have one maybe two that don't run. They see all their comrades fleeing and you know, cowardly fear or whatever, but they're going to stay and fight and, and earn their way into Valhalla. Uh, and what, but so, so essentially what you're doing is you're picking them up, picking the characters up in fear. Suddenly the army breaks, everybody's out, but it ain't over yet. Uh, and now you've got this last knucklehead to, to slay. And so you get a little bit of after action. It's sort of like, I've come to really, really appreciate uh, the scouring of the Shire from the Lord of the Rings. I just reread the series last month, and in the back of my head, I was kind of dreading getting to the scouring of the Shire part uh, because it's it seems so it seems like an epilogue, right? But I read it, I went into it with a, with open eyes, and it's not an epilogue at all. It isn't at all. It's part of the story. It's part of everything. 
Uh, it, the battle continues to go on after the battle is over. It's the whole thing the road goes ever, ever on. It was just, it's just this fantastic uh, continuation, addendum, the whole nine, you know, however you want to put it. Uh, and that's exactly what we're talking about in Trick of the Trade number four is give it to them. Give them, give them that last, uh, you know, jolt of adrenaline. Uh, the, the guy stays in the street. His army is fleeing and running away, but he does not. And now they got to hack their way through that. So it's very cool. Thank you for the sub, sub, clever. Very much appreciated. Uh, as we meander into Trick of the Trade number four, or number five, I guess, if you have not already, already, please give us a follow. We surely do appreciate it. Uh, let's see, Omzet, I missed one of your comments. I love to do that and tie it to a massive hit or a bold action. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime you can, and, and that's even better if if the army is beginning to disintegrate, and I assume that you're talking about, uh, and, they, and the characters do something overtly heroic, that even helps it better. And it's often up to you as the GM to decide, okay, they did this heroic thing. That's what breaks them. That's what sends the army. That's what sends the hobgoblins fleeing in terror. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it just comes with the territory. Oh, crap, we're doing a giveaway today. I forgot all about it. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good God. Yes, so there's a giveaway today. <laughs> is this to everybody? Tim, what's going on? Yes, thank you for watching. Here's your free PDF. Uh, it is a dark bird, you can get it here. All right, very cool. Yes. Good heavens. I forgot all about that. Um, down to the last five episodes. It's it's a good it's a good show. If you haven't watched Vikings, definitely watch it. Uh, all right, so is it that time already? Yeah, no, this is, she goes insanely fast, Great Pape. This is absolutely crazy. I think Tuesday's AMA went nuts. Uh, and we're gonna do a whole bunch of stuff on the weekend, week of the fourteenth. Is that right? Did I do that right? Yes. Uh, starting on the fourteenth. And 15th. We're going to do a whole bunch of shows. So, uh, no, there's no raffle this time. Everybody just uh, jump in and get it. <laughs> it won't link the whole thing, so copy and paste might be best. There you go. <laughs> oh, but was getting into, getting into it no matter what. <laughs> there you go. All right, so the last trick of the trade, and this is something... Uh, I, I honestly don't know if I've ever done this. I have seen it done at tables. This is... This is just, just, and I try in these tricks of the trade to never say don't do or no, don't ever control a player characters, a player's character's morale. Let them decide. Don't ever tell, they, they shouldn't be rolling morale checks. They shouldn't, there should be none of that. Um, they just don't, don't, <laughs> don't. That's their player, and if you do something like, that's their character, and if you do something like that, you can ruin the character for them. You can change the whole kind of trajectory of their of their story that they've kind of perpetuated. Better to kill the character than to sit there and say, you run away, your morale breaks, and you can't do this anymore. You can't stand up to these hobgoblins. They're too tough. You're too scared. You're out. Um, let them decide when their morale breaks. That's their character. They're looking at the hit points. They're looking at the armor class. They're looking at weapon wastage and equipment destruction. They have to decide when, when enough is enough. So don't ever ever do that because you're really going to wreck their character if you do it and you're going to wreck their perception of the character uh, and that will feed into everything that happens after that uh, when a player loses their connection to the character that they've created you've got a real problem on your hands because they're no longer vested in in the game uh, and they may still play but they're not going to be as into it they're not going to be solving things as enthusiastically they're not going to be helping other players enthusiastically there's not going to be any of that it's going they might do stuff but it's not going to be like you want them to the best way to break the character's morale is to break the player's morale be scary yeah that's just that's the perfect way of putting it last life douglas that's absolutely it uh, let the player decide oh, holy shit i got two hit points left i can't do this anymore i'm out i don't want to die and that's happened at my table many many times where players are going okay i'm, I, I'm out I, I fall back i can't i can't i'm not going to die i don't want to die like this um, what is that line from Matrix when the one woman dies? She's like, not like this, not like this. This is great. And that's it. I mean, let, let them to decide. Now, there's a little bit of a caveat there. If they're swept away by an army, as frequently happens, when an army disintegrates, you know, you're talking five, six, seven, and eight, whatever, 10,000 people on the field, and they begin to run, it's difficult to not run with them. So, you might get away with being swept away by simply saying something like, 
you know, the army breaks away and you can't actually muscle your way through to hold the line. There's so many people hitting you. Your shield gets hung on someone's elbow and they pull and twist you. And there's the force of the uh, this wedge of humanity coming past you with all of this armament is dragging you, uh, you know, away from the field, much to your chagrin and rage uh, or whatever it is. Um, that is sort of okay, but it but if it's just a a one on one controlling their morale, it's just a no go because it's some might not care, but most are going to care. <laughs> most are going to care, and it's going to come back to bite you in the butt in a huge way. A trophy full of Dr Pepper. <laughs> there you go. A trophy full of Dr Pepper cans. <laughs> That's what you need. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, so the mor morale is a huge, it's a huge part of the table, and it can play a great part in the game, both for the, the emotional craziness of of combat and also for the players themselves. And always bring it to the table, but use it use it sparingly. And if you're into the mechanic side of things, use them, uh, but don't be afraid to to ditch the mechanics and come up with your own reactive thing that's going on. Just like a player knows when he's going to break. You know when your army's going to break, uh, and let it happen. Uh, let morale, let morale sing. Does that make any sense? I don't think that makes any sense whatsoever. <clears throat> well, that's it for GM's tricks of the trade. Uh, we'll hang out for a little bit. If you have any questions, uh, we are. I'm not sure what we're doing next week. We've got obviously more GM's tricks of the trade, but I'm not sure what next week's is. Uh, I'm not even sure I've got it here. Somewhere, let me see if I can't pull that up. But we will be back on Tuesday for Ask Me Anything. And we do want to spread the word that starting on the 14th and 15th and going all through that next week, uh, we're going to be doing daily streams, uh, daily conversations over here. Uh, just a lot of jibber-jabbering, a lot of Ask Me Anythings. And so please join us for that. And we're going to kind of sp spread it out through the, the... Some will be in the day, some will be at night. Uh, so we get a little bit better. You know, everybody has an easier time to join us. Yep, I'm not sure what the next GM Strix the Trade is, but it'll be here next, uh, whatever day. Um, Thursday. <laughs> Thursday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Release may be expanded. A Fields of Battle box set. You know, it's funny you should say that, Omo. We literally just uploaded, so I, I never really liked the original cover. I love the blood splatter, but I never really liked the cover. So Peter Bradley did me two Valkyries. They're on the new cover. Now, it's the same book, so don't go buy it. It's just exact same book, different cover, um, but uh, and we just got that uploaded today. We've got those in the in the mailroom ready to ship today for anyone who orders it in the future. Um, but all that did was fire me up for the original box set because we had just what we had playing pieces in there. We had some stuff from Fat Dragon Games in there, uh, and now we've got an even better box making company uh, that can make really stout boxes. Now you guys know them. They're the Dungeons of Alfstrag and uh, the archive sets for 5th edition. Yeah, so I'm really kind of stoked. It's been on... It, it. I will say this. It has crossed my mind, Omut, to bring that thing back and get even more into bed with Tom Tullis. Can I say that? Get <laughs> work closer with Tullis. Get more of his material over there uh, and really pump that thing up. Uh, I just... I love these box sets that we've been putting out. They're sturdy, they're stout, uh, they, there's no wraparounds, so they don't peel or any of that mess. Just good stuff. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us, Obsidian. Very much appreciated. Castle Zagid question, uh, was there any debate on whether it was a good idea to require a fear check before PCs could approach the, <laughs> approach the castle? That was all Gary. That's all Gary. Jeffrey Talanian had a, a bit to do with that. He was Gary's co-writer on that. But uh, that I, I did not... What Gary gave me, I published. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't question. Uh, listen, you know, I, I read most of what he sent us. Uh, I remember reading The Hermit, being just absolutely blown away by that adventure. I loved that adventure. I still love that adventure to this day. Uh, Hall of Many Pains had an immediate impact on my own game, uh, my own creation in the world of Aired. Uh, and then, of course, World Builder is uh, a whole other... It's just difficult to describe the impact World Builder had on me and the company and all that. And then the Living Fantasy book, which was my favorite of his publications, uh, just kind of opened this door to 
and the genius that was Gary Gygax. So, um, I did <laughs> if that question had been posed to me, I wouldn't have, <laughs> I wouldn't have argued with Gary. Now, Jeff may have, uh, Jeff is a very good game designer. You can find his stuff over at, um, the Hyborian World stuff. Uh, what is it? Damn it. Adventure or something. Anyways, you guys know his company. Someone post Jeff's company. Ah! Um, what is that called? Ah, anyways. Um, so Jeff may have argued with him, but I, I, that I don't, <laughs> that I was not part of that. A new, a new box that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm really, I, <clears throat> I, I'm going to box everything. I'm fixing to an Amazing Adventures box set. Uh, Northwind Games. There you go. Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. Hello, Melkor. How's it going? You said hello at the beginning of the stream and <laughs> it completely went out of my head. How's it going, man? Uh, yeah, Northwind Games. Yeah, Jeff is a fantastic writer and a great game designer. Uh, he and Gary worked very, very well together on Castle Zagging, and it was just my pleasure to be the publisher. Uh, all very good stuff. And just to fill out my backer survey for Mazas and Treasures. Excellent. That uh, Starship Warden landed on my desk yesterday, the final copy. I'll do a final look over to tomorrow, but I'm hoping it's printed by Monday. And uh, I think him and TV will be on my desk tomorrow. So I'm very stoked to get those two guys done. And then it's all hands on deck for the player's handbook. Uh, thanks for the fun, guys. I feel my my morale increasing every time one of these things. <laughs> Very cool. See you, Grandpa. Uh, there you go. So there are a couple spells that for the duration say see below, but then are not addressed in the text below. Any insight on what these durations may be? Sharpen senses is an example. I tell you what, I'd have to look at them, Grape Ape, but we are literally fixing things like that in the Player's Handbook and the CKG now. Uh, if you can email that to, to me or to Tim or to Chuck or somebody, <laughs> throw it out somewhere, you know, we will go in and fix it. There's a few things like that. I think there was quite a discussion on parrying, I think. Uh, it's different in the CKG than the Player's Handbook. That's going to be lined up. Things like that need to be fixed. Uh, I know that some people get hung up on <clears throat> some editing. I don't really give a... I mean, I care. I want the company to do as good, but when I'm reading a book, I don't really care about that. But I do want consistency in things like parrying and whatnot. So let us know about that, uh, Grape Ape, and we will get that fixed. Uh, and better now than, than... I mean, literally, this is the time, because by next week, I'll be ass deep in the, the Player's Handbook and the CKG. So <laughs> there you go. We are in full layout, and we're still fixing things, but we're in full layout. So uh, now it's definitely a time. All right. Well, I'm going to be calling Luke here uh, after this stream. So, <laughs> so you all have a absolutely love the wide-eyed pig, Gary. But yeah, I love that picture. He was he was getting a little frustrated with me because we needed we were doing a portrait, and we ended up not using the portrait. That's a different story. But uh, we, <laughs> we were doing this portrait, and we needed these whatever pictures from different directions. And he was getting a little irritated, so he just started sending me crazy pictures. <laughs> it was so funny. I'm not sure who the photographer was, but um, I think it was someone that he knew. But <laughs> it was just funny. Um, oh, yeah. Quick, yeah, but get on with it. Yeah, I got to call him. So, <laughs> so you all have a great rest of your week and have a wonderful weekend. And uh, we will see you back again for Ask Me Anything next Tuesday at 4 o'clock and GM's Trick to the Trade again on Thursday at 4 o'clock. Uh, thank you all for showing up. Very much appreciate it. Thanks for the follows and the subscriptions. And we will see you next week. All right. Where am I stopping? All right. Stop streaming. All right, everybody. <laughs> y'all take care. <laughs>